So hi everyone, my name is Caroline Howard. I'm originally from the US, but have been living in London for the past three years working for an advertising technology firm. Oh, and I will be joining um, my fellow Oxford people uh, in the fall for the MBA program. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Peter Marshall, uh, originally from Belfast in Northern Ireland. Uh, for the past four years, I have been doing um, capital markets consulting in New York, and I will also be going uh, to Oxford later this year. My name is Kerry. I'm going to be an incoming candidate at Cambridge Judge Business School. I've been in Bay Area for four years and four years in Copenhagen before that, uh, working in consulting mainly in life sciences. Hi everyone, thank you for joining our presentation. So I'm Renata, I'm from Brazil, and I'll be joining Cambridge MBA in September. To kick things off? Yeah. I think just firstly, thanks to Katie for uh, prompting us. It's been, I think, as Caroline said, a journey, uh, multiple time zones, multiple continents. Uh, we've enjoyed creating this. We hope you enjoy what we have to say. So our, our presentation is Console to Cloud, and it's focused on an analysis of Microsoft's um, cloud-based gaming strategy. And we've pulled this as our first slide, and this is a quote from Microsoft's 2019 10K filing. And we were talking about this yesterday, grabbing coffee, how important this quote is. Uh, we live in a world today where consumers are probably the most demanding they've ever been. They want things convenient, they want things accessible. And for us, if Microsoft is going to remain competitive in the gaming space, if it's going to increase its competitiveness, um, this approach is really pivotal to that. So moving on to industry trends. This is, this is a survey of US internet users, um, ga gamers. And we can see that consoles actually lag here in third place. Um, they're surpassed by mobile smart, um, smartphones and, uh, and computers. And when we look at the trend of console sales from 2008 to 2018, we see, we see a decline there as well. We see 90 million units sold in 2008, and that's basically halved um, to where we are now. So where's this revenue going to come from? Well, moving on to subscriptions, and we can see here there are three metrics that are being compared here uh, for non-subscribers versus subscribers. So the number of games being played, the amount of time spent playing games, and the amount of revenue being generated from those subscribers by the companies providing those that content. So in summary on the slide, subscribers are playing more games, they're more engaged, they're playing for longer, and they're investing more. It might not be as much upfront, but that, that amount is going to be over a longer term. So how does, what do we see in Microsoft? And that, does that reflect what we're seeing in the industry in general? This is a comparison of the Xbox, three, Xbox 360 and Xbox One consoles. So we do see a general decline. And what's interesting here is actually we see a little hump in the middle. And from what we, from what we can gather from this, this will be where the Xbox 360 console is probably most accessible. It's cheapest. Um, and, and that also lends, lends weight to the fact that people are looking for something where they can kind of overcome the entry barrier for less cost. And, and that reinforces our subscription. Uh, focus as well. And so how's Microsoft's subscription going? Well, their subscriptions of, uh, of Xbox Live from Q1 2016 over to, what do we have at the end? Thank you. Um, we see a rise. Uh, and obviously, that's good. Um, there's a lot of potential here that we feel. And that's what, obviously, this presentation is going to be based on. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Renata to uh, focus more on cloud gaming. So we ha already have like three players who've tried uh, the cloud gaming before. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, I didn't make the introduction about the cloud gaming. So cloud gaming is when you can play uh, a video game without a console, so you don't need a box. And you can play it like almost in any device because all the technology and the speed that you need uh, to play it, it's not on the console, it's on the cloud. And we have already, uh, we have some players who have tried it and so, for example, OnLive, G Cluster Global, and Gamefly, but they all have failed. <laughs> <laughs> and that happened uh, because of they didn't have the right environment to succeed. So here it's, uh, you can see the internet speed from uh, uh, 2007 to 2017. And w when they tried it, it was around uh, 2010, they had one-fifth of the uh, internet speed that we have today. So 
it was not like proper. Oh, sorry. So about the, the cloud gaming landscape today, we have uh, th the market is growing uh, a lot. So <laughs> uh, in 2018, it used to be uh, 234 million, and now it's like 1.5 billion uh, dollar worth market. And we have some uh, players here, some who ha who are not live, and some who are already live. So the ones that who are not live, uh, we have so X Cloud. Uh, they uh, Microsoft announced it in October 2018. Uh, we're waiting for it. Uh, Stadia. It's um, probably a big competitor. It's Google's uh, product. Um, th they have a big. Uh, they have a competitive advantage since they uh, have YouTube and uh, Chromecast like behind it. So, yeah, and then. <laughs> Uh, there is NVIDIA and Shadow who allow you to play a uh, video game in any device that you have. Uh, you have PlayStation now, so you can uh, uh, play uh, do the PlayStation gaming in any device too, uh, uh, but um, Ma Mac uh, computers. And yeah, you have uh, Jump who is uh, indie, more for indie games, and play Giga who is more B2B. So yeah, these are some uh, players in the market, and uh, Peter will t uh, tell us a bit more about uh, Microsoft. Yeah, thanks guys. Um, so what we've really done there is we've kind of laid the groundwork in the context of how the market looks. Um, so what I'd like to look now is towards Microsoft. We are here today. <laughs> so clearly Microsoft has been thinking about this for at least two years, probably longer, but to us forward facing, what we could find was two years. So in January 2018, they started off by buying a um, or acquiring a PlayFab, who was a de who created uh, creates developer tools for cloud gaming. Very easy way for Microsoft to begin ramping up its exercise by quickly acquiring. Then um, October last year, they announced that their solution is going to be XCloud, um, that will run on PC, Windows, um, and mobile. Uh, it'll be completely platform agnostic. Uh, then at E3, or sorry, just before E3, um, they announced uh, quite a vague um, Microsoft and Sony gamer sh gamer um, gaming partnership. So what we know so far, or what we've been told so far, is that um, Sony will essentially use Microsoft's uh, Cloud Azure platform to enable um, faster and more consistent streaming because as Renata pointed out, they do have PlayStation now. However, it's um, it's been quite weak. It hasn't worked quite as planned to the point now where they've actually had to pivot their product to not only just allow cloud streaming, but to also allow you to download the games onto your console, which kind of defeats the purpose of cloud gaming. Um, that brings us then to roughly E3 when they announced that uh, a beta will launch in October of 2019. So if we go to the next slide. All right, so we're business students, right? What does a business student love to do? Do a little SWOT analysis. Um, so if we start, um, sorry, yeah, for those who are maybe not initiated on what a SWOT analysis is, so it stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So your strengths and your weaknesses are internal to your company, your opportunities and your threats are external. So if we start off with the top left and the strengths, Microsoft has obviously got a very strong brand. Um, it has survived a very competitive landscape here in Silicon Valley and just generally in, in, in gaming, or sorry, in computer systems. Um, they have an expert, you guys have an expertise in cloud gaming, cloud gaming and hardware technology. Um, you are able to execute all those in three areas and uh, streamline them and make them work together through your, you know, you can create an Xbox that will run software and it's a great, hard, great piece of hardware. And lastly, in the strengths, um, you have $11 billion in cash assets that will allow you to make acquisitions, do a lot of research. Um, market the hell out of your product because that's marketing is one of the things that's kind of going to win the day, right? So then when we look then at the weaknesses that are internal, so unfortunately in this generation, um, and this is a bit of an awkward thing to say in front of Microsoft employees, the console this year, this generation has slightly been the weakest, has been the weakest um, with, this l with the lowest seals. Um, the recent first party releases have been disappointing to critics and the market. If we think of something like Sea of Thieves or Crackdown 3, um, it was not well received. People still played it, but um, it didn't quite capture the market that we had all hoped. Uh, the, um, 
the next weakness is that the you, uh, Microsoft and Xbox specifically has quite a confusing console and service naming convention and lineup. So right now you have three or four, sorry, you have four different Xbox One. You have four, uh, the X Xbox One, the Xbox One X, the Xbox One All Digital, and the Xbox One S. So to the average consumer, I go into a shop or I go into, I go onto your website, what version of the console is correct for me? That also translates to your, um, your services, so Xbox Live Gold, Xbox Live uh, Gaming Pass, Xbox Live Gaming Pass um, All Access, and it's just kind of, okay, well, me as a consumer, what, what, what should I pick? Um, next, so the previous attempts at, uh, oh. <laughs> so the last weakness is previous attempts at a gaming uh, Windows platform have been lackluster, so about 10 years ago, um, Microsoft came out with games f with the games for Windows platform that was based loosely on Xbox technology, um, and developers and publishers didn't really want to use it, and they preferred to pick a competitor like Steam. So then when we move on to the opportunities that are external, so certainly you have a first mover advantage for the next console. You announced it at E3, um, and out of all the other kind of competitors that are out there in the market, nobody has really been able to announce, or nobody has started announcing what their next generation console is. Um, as I mentioned before, so Sony's attempt at a streaming service has been um, lacking, so you have an advantage there. Nintendo, who is the third big competitor for the console market, do, does not have a streaming service at all, and their, their online platform as a whole is, is not there yet. Um, the proliferation of mobile devices and people expecting and becoming accustomed to gaming on the go. We all have smartphones in our pocket, we all have tablets, and we all get used to now on our commutes or just sitting around pulling out our phone and playing a quick game. Uh, lastly, so the expansion and the introduction of 5G to the market. So obviously game streaming requires very fast connections. We can all maybe do that at home on our fiber optic, but when we're out and about, 4G is not gonna quite cut it yet, so whenever 5G comes, uh, starts rolling out, we will. Uh, and then lastly, the threats. So competitors are quickly coming to the market. As Renata mentioned, Google Stadia is announcing that it is playing, um, or sorry, is releasing in a beta format or a slow rollout later this year. PlayStation now is already there. Um, what was the, um, the computer one? Anyway, th there's, uh, there's a lot. Shadow. Shadow, that's the one, sorry guys, yes. Um, so then customer sentiment has, um, you guys, Microsoft will have to do quite a lot to make um, consumers comfortable with losing access and ownership of their own, you know, their own games. Um, we're used to owning a disc or buying it from Steam or Xbox and we're always owning it. So like Netflix, when we no longer have your subscription, are we going to lose access to our games? And the answer is yes. Um, customer appetite. Is there really an appetite for yet another subscription service? So we have Netflix, Spotify, Hulu. At what point do we kind of just go as consumers? We don't want to um, pay for any more monthly subscriptions. Um, obviously customers in rural areas, so this doesn't apply to anybody really in this room, but if, if we're living in something like Montana or Minnesota, is our connection going to be strong enough to uh, consistently stream these games? Uh, we also have to convince publishers and developers, right? So currently, publishers and developers are very happy just to release games and get a nice cut, get a nice big chunk of the profits. Whenever it comes to streaming, how does that revenue model work and who's gonna walk away making the most money? And of course, lastly, the retaliation from retail partners like GameStop and Best Buy. So they actually rely very heavily on game discs and secondhand game sales. With a streaming service, there's no need for that. So where would be the advantage for Best Buy or GameStop to stock a Microsoft console when it's only a one-time purchase? And that's, that's kind of where we are with that. So then I'll move it on to Caroline for the recommendations. Hi, so moving on to recommendations. So this is um, our view of maybe some, some options for Microsoft as you know, we've explored the space and kind of what we think might, might make Microsoft successful. Um, so the first uh, recommendation kind of falls under the category of bundling. Um, and so we've broken this down into two pieces, the first being internal and the second external. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, Microsoft has a rather confusing to the outside customer uh, lineup of consoles available and subscription services available. And um, in, in addition to like bundling xCloud with other subscription offerings or other console offerings, uh, we would also recommend just streamlining the naming convention. 
Um, one thing that we've seen and was successful for Microsoft, uh, I think it was last year, they did a Microsoft all access promotion where users could pay, I think it was around $36 a month and get, get access to a console, an Xbox Live subscription and the Xbox Game Pass. Um, and from what we gathered online, that was rather successful for the company. Um, so potentially doing something similar like that to xCloud where xCloud becomes like your console in the cloud um, and bundling that with other offerings. Um, as Peter touched on, um, we're seeing uh, increasing subscription fatigue uh, in the market. So Deloitte just released their digital trend survey and they said that consumers pretty much tap out in terms of video streaming at around three subscription services. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what the market does in terms of gaming subscriptions, whether that if, whether they have you know, a renewed capacity for subscriptions when it comes to gaming or if they bundle subscriptions in terms of entertainment more generally. And based on you know, what, what becomes of that, it might be useful for Microsoft to consider external partnerships uh, with a third party content streaming service like maybe Hulu or Spotify to offer some type of bundle um, that would include both gaming and video streaming or music streaming, what have you. Um, so our second recommendation falls under the topic of acquisitions. So Microsoft has been more acquisitive in the gaming space in recent years, um, or in 2018 rather than they have in the past you know, four or five years, um, mainly acquiring uh, gaming studios. And we think that continuing that smart acquisition uh, could be um, really beneficial for Microsoft to um, both corner great content that's coming out, uh, like Peter touched on, earlier, um, it'll be interesting to see as we move to a subscription model uh, in the gaming space how uh, the gaming studios are compensated. So by either acquiring studios or partnering with them strategically, whether it's like a joint venture or something like that, um, I think it would be beneficial to Microsoft in that way. And then finally, integration. So one thing that we didn't touch on, um, but that's been quite big for Microsoft recently is Mixer and, and that acquisition. And we propose just further integrating Mixer into the Xbox world. Um, as you can see here, numbers of hours watched on Mixer from 2018 to 2019 has really stair-stepped in growth, which is incredible. Um, and so by folding Mixer more into the Xbox family, um, we think that that could be a a really good like revenue driver for Microsoft, um, whether that's integrating it to where you can like watch and then play along, or you know investing more in Mixer to get different streaming personalities to come to the platform. So that is our presentation for you. Thank you so much uh, for listening, and we can open it up for questions if you have any. Um, happy happy to chat. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It was really wonderful. Uh, I enjoyed listening to all the different advantages and disadvantages of our different games. Out of curiosity, given the plethora of reasons for weaknesses of all these games and all the threats, um, since all of our competitors have honestly an overwhelming success with their release of games compared to Microsoft, what is your analysis of why the Xbox consoles have increased in sales as compared to the typical industry of decreasing? So I can take that one. So Xbox consoles actually follow the industry trends in terms of declining sales, at least in the information we were able to find. You might know something we don't. Um, <laughs> Sorry, no, it was this one, right? Uh, no, no, yeah, so, so that's, that's industry. So maybe it's helpful to look at that first. Um, yeah. Sorry, yeah, so industry-wide, you see you know, a decline here, and then there's a bump in 2017 and 2018, largely because of, I think that's Nintendo's, uh, Nintendo Switch, yeah, enters the market at that time. And so you see a bump kind of overall, but on, on the whole, it's a general decline. And then that's, that's pretty much mirrored in Microsoft as well. And obviously, these things have to do with um, the longevity of the console, so how long people are keeping it. And that's not something that I ha personally have familiarity with. But on the whole, it's like a clear kind of downward trend, and we're not seeing it mirror what, what we saw with the Xbox 360. Um, so that's what informed our thesis of like a move away from the console toward a solution that really emphasizes the subscription. What was the next chart? 
So that's the monthly active users of Xbox Live. So what we really took away from this data was that Microsoft, like other companies in the gaming sphere, are really seeing a lot of revenue being driven from their subscription services rather than the console. So in reading the Microsoft like 10K filing, um, they were talking about how um, Xbox hit a huge milestone in terms of revenue that it's brought in, but not because of console sales. There was a decrease, I think it was by about 10% in console sales, um, which was offset by increasing subscription sales and increasing subscription growth, both from Xbox Live and Game Pass. Um, so that's been a huge um, you know, success driver for Microsoft in the past year. So your recommendations are different ways that uh, Microsoft can increase its subscriptions. Increase subscriptions and like leverage the in leverage the success of subscription to make X Cloud, um, you know, the best that it can be and really corner that market. Um, because one of the things, when we were researching this and looking at the Microsoft-Sony partnership, which is how we kind of became interested in this topic, um, was that there really wasn't a lot of data about how Sony and Microsoft uh, would partner. Um, and you guys probably know more about this than we do. Uh, but the only thing that was for certain was that Sony was probably going to be using uh, Azure, um, your cloud platform, to, to host its, its streaming service. And for us, like, that's 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 a great thing to do, but I think Microsoft really has a lot of other competitive advantages. Like it shouldn't it shouldn't go all in on that Sony partnership. Like we think Xbox can really corner the market here. Like clearly they're seeing people are people want to pay and play their games, and they have the the cloud chops to do it. Um, so with X Cloud, if you can combine those two things, it could be very successful. Now, out of curiosity, did you do more analysis on the numbers of say combining all of uh, Microsoft's different products, how much that would increase the subscription and barrier to entry versus like acquisitions and things like that? So that would be incredible to do, but I don't think we have the resources to do that or okay. the data. Um, but I can pass it off to Peter. You look like you had something you wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. So I think to your last question, it was a limitation in data. Um, and maybe um, I think you may have picked up that during the SWOT analysis that we had done, maybe I was a bit more negative than I came across negative than I should have. I apologize, that's my Northern Irish demeanor, first of all, right? So um, I think there's a real success story here in the two things that we're showing. Sure, the actual console sales are declining, but what we are seeing is that people are keeping the console and using it, and you're, you know, Microsoft is enjoying a recurring uh, subscription service, which every company kind of wants. Why would you want to sell thing, something for once when you could sell something every month? At a, sure, at a smaller price, but consistently is great. So um, yes, um, I can see where, you, where you're coming from that it did come across as negative that, that the competitors are doing better, but in reality, I don't think that's the case. On the history slide, we kind of went through what was announced at um, so here in June, um, console streaming capability was also announced in addition to xCloud. Um, and I think that that is, is really quite smart. Obviously, we like for the purpose of this presentation, we really want cloud to be the future. Um, but just yesterday, as a part of our check, uh, we were meeting with some investors that are really interested in the cloud space and kind of got to talking to them about it. And they were, they were worried that the internet speeds are still too slow and it won't be until 5G that we're actually able to achieve success in cloud gaming. So I think it's really smart that Microsoft is diversifying in terms of allowing for console streaming capability, where the console becomes the server um, um, and is like, like on not quite on the edge, like edge computing, but similar to that, um, that way of thinking. So um, I forget where I was going with that, but just that I think a, a hybrid approach is actually quite smart in terms of how to enter the market. Um, and then last question: Were the increase in subscriptions mainly existing users or new ones as well? So that's a limitation in our data. Um, okay. It's hard. It's hard to. It's hard to find publicly available data that's that specific. I think j just touching on that though, what would be worrying is if we were seeing a decrease here, right? I mean, right. we're seeing industry-wide, we're seeing a decrease in consoles, and that's mirrored by and large. I know there are some anomalies on there, but by and large in Microsoft, we're seeing that subscriptions can be extremely profitable. They're engaging, they're more engaging um, by far. Um, and, and obviously we can see that Microsoft's trending in the right way. And it just needs to, f in our point of view, it needs yeah. to maximize that and keep on, keep yeah. on going. And I think you mentioned uh, streamlining the, 
the, the offerings. There's, there's like an interesting like management tool where you can run through whether bundling is successful or not if you know the individual like unit costs and like people's propensity to buy. I'm sure Microsoft has done that exercise, um, but it, it might be interesting just to look at that again in the context of xCloud and um, all the increase in subs subscription growth. Thank you very much. From an opportunities perspective, uh, what's your take on uh, Microsoft's recent acquisition or turnover from Twitch of Ninja to Mixer? Um, I think that's very powerful, right? So the only reason people watch Twitch are the interesting personalities. So by bringing in interesting personalities, um, it's like signing a great player to a football team. Um, I don't know the specifics of the deal, whether it's, it's whether Microsoft is paying or he kind of made that transition on his own. But by bringing um, good personalities to the service, you're going to bring eyeballs to that service, and then you will create new users that want to use Mixer, mm -hmm. and then they can become the personalities of the future because the personalities are, are is what is really driving um, people that watch um, people streaming games. Okay. Uh, another question on the subscription model, like you said that Microsoft moving forward should partner with uh, uh, Spotify or uh, other mm -hmm. such competitors. Uh, won't it be a better opportunity if they uh, do it with gamers specifically when the market exists probably in Montreal or EA Sports, for example, who are actually developing those games instead of the other music streaming companies? Uh, so as part of the X Cloud, or as part of Game Pass, as you know, so they offer a number of games from those publishers already. Our suggestion of bundling was really um, so instead of you as a consumer paying seven ninety nine a month for Game Pass and then nine ninety nine a month for Hulu and then maybe nine ninety nine a month for Spotify, if you could have a kind of a, a three all three in one bundled for fourteen ninety nine. You as a consumer, you know, as a consumer, you might be more interested in that um, rather than having having three separate. Because I believe who um, I believe if you have a Spotify Premium account now, you get a Hulu account directly with it, and that's proved to be very successful for Spotify. That's kind of I think one of the reasons that they have been able to skyrocket to the largest market share in music streaming. So, bundling is a nice way of bringing people in. And you want to add something to that? Sorry, Carla. And another another um, kind of point to add on looking outside the gaming sphere in terms of bundling opportunities is you have consumers that are they're 100% going to have a net Netflix subscription. Like my husband kind of falls into this category. We're definitely going to have Netflix, but I'm not sure he's going to spend to have Game Pass or xCloud or something like that. But if it were, if it were like an add on to Spotify where it was like, you know, just a few, you know, a few dollars more a month or a few dollars more a month, like he would definitely do that. Um, so I think it's it's getting people that might not seek out the service on their own, but see see it as an option somewhere and a checkout. Like, oh, if I just add that on, it's a little bit more. I'll definitely you know make use of that. Um, so it's just like expanding the reach of the Xbox Cloud offering in this case, and um, like potentially you know cornering the market in that way and taking um, taking the largest market share. And it, it wouldn't even have to be external bundling. You know, you could yeah. very easily bundle with Office three six five. One drive, you know, if I have a subscription. Yeah, uh, well, or Xbox with Office 365, Xbox with One Drive. Um, if you'd had, um, I believe Microsoft did have a streaming platform, but they closed it a couple of years ago. If that was still around, that would be a perfect opportunity to bundle as well, because then you get customer lock in, right? Hey, thanks for uh, the presentation. Since you guys are uh, incoming MBA students, I was wondering if you've done sort of an industry look at the various forces, uh, you know, using the five forces framework to see how competitive this industry is going to be and whether or not it's attractive for Microsoft to be, make a big investment in this area. See, um, so, so like entry, you know, customers, suppliers, competitive internally, and also um, uh, substitutes. So for the purposes of this presentation, we felt that a SWOT analysis was better, purely because we were just looking at, we were just wanting to focus on Microsoft and its approach, looking outward rather than taking the industry um, as a whole. Um, 
Okay. But yeah, you're right. As as MBA students, there are two things that we love. There are a few things that we love more than a SWOT analysis and a Porter's Five Forces. Right, right, right. So I was uh, a follow up question since somebody mentioned the Twitch. I was wondering if do you think of uh, Amazon as a potential threat coming into this market? Certainly. So I believe they have Amazon. They do have an Amazon Game Studio. I don't think that they have. They've any released anything yet. They're working on an MMO, I believe. Um, they could be yes. Um, Sorry. So I think one of the things that came became clear to me as someone that's not um, not a gamer doesn't have much experience in the space is that Microsoft is a, is second only to Amazon in terms of cloud computing. Um, sorry, is that not true? Oh, some measures are equal. Yeah. Okay. If you look at so you know depending on what data you look at, um, but my point there being is that. Um, Microsoft really holds its own, and it's the only one of the big tech companies that also has an established history of gaming. And I think that when you combine those two together, it makes a really compelling case for really leaning into cloud gaming because you have the cloud, you have the cloud background, and you have the gaming background. And there's not really any other company that does. Do you guys think that this industry is going to be really fragmented, meaning lots of players, or is it going to be like, you know, duopoly or? or very few players, big players, that controls the industry? I think it's going to probably start off fragmented. So we have, you know, we have Shadow, um, we have Steam might try something, we have Amazon might try something, we have Google coming this year. But I think what you'll see is that um, the people that are first and produce the best product will probably be the ones that win, um, much like in the kind of the current streaming wars that we're seeing. Um, and just to come back to, sorry, I just had a, uh, while Caroline was talking, something just hit me. Um, I think Microsoft, ha its core competence, the reason I think Microsoft is better positioned than Amazon, right, is that their core competencies are spread much better than Amazon. Amazon is a, is a shopping platform with some very good cloud technology, but Microsoft is, um, is able to bring in hardware, software, and through your first party um, owners of um, Microsoft Game Studios, you have some of the best studios. You have Coalition 343 Industries, Turn 10, who produces a fantastic, you know, fantastic racing games. Everything is sitting there, ready to just be combined and bundled and you know, create, a mar create a product that I think can outdo the competition. I feel like this industry is going to be not fragmented because scale is going to be a big you know, big leverage yeah. from a, and from with a Google and a, you know Amazon potentially, and, and Microsoft, we can really drive down the cost yeah. of subscription. Yeah, and, and which which gives consumers like a lot of benefits. And the smaller players, they can't really do that. My prediction would be that the smaller players will probably end up being acquired, like especially yeah. Shadow. Like if I were Microsoft, I would be looking into acquiring them depending on what proprietary technologies they have. Um, I, I don't know, but um, yeah, I think, I think that those, there will be like a lot of people that try, or a lot of companies that try to enter the space, um, but I, d I don't think that they will ultimately be successful because obviously they have to pay cloud hosting fees and those costs get expensive and you know the bigger players that already have established cloud platforms have a true advantage there. Well, we've already seen that so on online field um, Sony purchased their assets and it was the same with Geico no not Geico um, Gamefly yes Geico no th there's one oh Ga is it Geico sorry there was a, another service called Geico and so whenever it f whenever it collapsed again Sony brought or bought its assets and PlayStation now is essentially those those assets in that IP um, so I think I agree with you, I, but I think initially there will be many small players, a couple of the big players who can actually ramp up and own um, the cloud infrastructure and the server space that is required. Um, because you need, you know, you need to have a server in pretty much every major city to reduce latency. And uh, to your point, smaller players just cannot compete with the the infrastructure that Microsoft and Amazon can build. So I have a couple of questions. So why do you think uh, Sony has chosen Azure versus AWS? given that Microsoft is their largest competitor for years, if not decades to come? Probably based on the strength of the platform. Um, I think... Wh which particular portion of it? What do you mean? Uh, the speed, um, the scalability, and the, the, custom, the custom ability of it. Um, I, I don't know, I'm not a cloud kind of technology expert, but my feeling is AWS is rather stock and standard. Um, whereas I think Azure, Azure is more um, can be customized and tailored to the individual kind of client's need. 
I wish I wish AWS customers knew that. I mean, there's <laughs> three times of them compared to ours, but yeah. Uh, and second question I have. Um, do you have something to say? Sorry. Oh, no, I was just curious to hear your thoughts. Like, why, you know, why did you think that them chose Microsoft? Because uh, I think AWS has way more to learn from Sony than Microsoft. That's why. Yeah. Because they're, they're going to build something, too. They're working on it. Anyway, uh, second question I had. Um, have you done any analysis on uh, how much contribution to the PlayStation 4 sales PlayStation Now has made? Uh, no, but anecdotally, so I'm a hu I, I own all the consoles, but Microsoft, and I'm not saying this just because I'm standing here, Microsoft is the one that I prefer. I've had an Xbox Live account for 11 years, um, and I've been very happy to pay that, you know, the subscription every month. I think the reason, um, I don't think it has contributed to a, to a lot. I hear a lot of complaints from people that I know that have PlayStations that the PlayStation Now platform just doesn't work terribly well. The offerings of game is, games aren't great. Um, it's very unpredictable in its, um, you know, it's very inconsistent in how it, how it plays uh, to the point where they're now actually kind of copying Microsoft Game Pass by allowing um, gamers to download the actual games to their physical console. So to me, that's a signal that PlayStation Now isn't quite living up to the hope um, and the plan that they initially came up with. And does it have the technology stops? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Then the follow-up question to that, do you think uh, PlayStation Now will be much better off uh, if executed and ran on Azure? Yeah, right. Um, to me, Sony is a hardware company. It's not a software company. So the reason they're coming to you is because you are a software company that also does great hardware. Hey, I, have a play I have a Surface Pro 6 here. It's the best laptop I've ever had. But um, uh, yeah, you guys have the combination of, of hardware and software. Sony doesn't have that. So they rely on people like yourselves with better software. Um, but I, I have a question about, um, do you think the growth in the future will be the home uh, console or like a plugging Comcast thing, uh, just like a Stadia, or it's going to be mobile? If it's going to be mobile, then it's bottlenecked by the 5G, both price and the data, especially the price. I haven't calculated how how many gigabytes that data we're going to transfer per hour if you use the mobile device for gaming. But we're paying 120 bucks now for gig, four gig of data with Verizon. I think it's better if if we think the growth is going to be in the mobile device, it's better for us to partner with Verizon, you know, service provider, internet service provider, or well as internet service providers to, to drive down the, uh, the, 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 the price of the, uh, the wireless service plan. Um, how, do, how, do, how do you guys think about this? So um, to come to your f the first part of your question, whether, you, whether or not it's going to be a mobile or a console or like a, a, a dongle, I think it's going to be a combination of all three. So I, I kind of see it being very ubiquitous where I would be sitting at home, I'd play the beginning of a mission of Red Dead Redemption on my console, then I have to make my way out to JFK, so I, in the back of the taxi, I finish that, I continue that mission on maybe my Nintendo Switch, if you guys go platform agnostic, or on my mobile phone, and then whenever I'm sitting in the airport um, waiting for my flight, I pull out my laptop and I finish that mission. Um, whether, when it comes to bundling with mobile providers, that's certainly an option. Um, but I think the real, I think what you were maybe trying to just ask in your question is where, where we think it, it's going, and I think it's going to be ubiquitous. And I think consumers now expect it to, to just be able to play games wherever you want. And you've seen that with Fortnite. So your account transfers across all of your consoles, all your PCs, all your mobile devices. I can very easily, you know, play one match on my mobile phone when I'm in work, not doing work. And then um, whenever I get home, I can uh, continue playing games on the same account on a different console. Um, I have a question. So what's your view on why Microsoft is partnering with Sony? Like they, they are our partners, but at the same time, they are our competitors. So how, how, how should Microsoft kind of handle this partnership? Oh, sure. Cool. Um, so I think that from a PR perspective, it sends a really interesting signal to the market that um, you're not willing to like to back down in terms of like Google offering um, up a gaming solution. And I also think that, you know, it's powerful too and that PlayStation chose you over your competitors. Um, so I think just from like a PR perspective, I think it's a wise move. Um, as, as far as the, the more strategic reasoning behind it, um, that I'm not sure about, so I'll pass it over to you. <laughs> 
I think you have far more to offer Sony than Microsoft or than Sony has to offer Microsoft. Um, I, not knowing the specifics of the deal, I imagine it's a fairly kind of um, straight, simple deal where they will pay you for access to your cloud platform. Um, and, they, and they need it because they don't have access to the infrastructure. I don't think there's terribly much that, that Sony can or Microsoft can gain from it other than a financial um, increase. Uh, thanks a lot, guys, for sharing all these knowledge gems. Um, so I'm not much of a gamer, um, but I've been especially following the gaming industry, and um, I know that you know from what we've seen from Black Mirror episodes and all of that, you know, AR um, seems to be um, way more engaging than you know the current uh, traditional ways of gaming. Um, and there are some imagine big players like Facebook. Um, can you guys just speak to you know what you think about you know um, the AR scene um, picking up um, in the near uh, future and what kind of um, competitive advantage would you know a company like Facebook mm -hmm. um, have over um, players like us who don't really do much in that space yet or who aren't really big players yet? So. Um in, in that technology line, there are kind of two big things. There's AR and VR. Um, so AR is HoloLens, and I think, um, I think that's probably the more interesting and easier transition for gamers. Um, I think Personally, I find VR very hard, very hard to use. Um, very, it's quite stressful. It makes me dizzy. Um, AR is nice and easier because it's just essentially putting it on the wall or in the room with you, and it's not shutting you off from the world. So uh, I believe Microsoft put on a very interesting AR presentation using HoloLens, where they use Minecraft, and so you could just have the table and you can play the Minecraft game right here. Um, and I think that is much more engaging and interactive than, than VR. Um, and I, I think an easier transition will be AR, and then maybe, and maybe down the line VR. Hi. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk in the streaming world for entertainment that to get loyalty, you need to have the content that people care about and have it exclusively. Like people love Stranger Things, so they're going to keep Netflix for that. But I once met a guy with an Xbox logo tattoo on his shoulder. And I was wondering, do you feel in the gaming streaming space, there's an opportunity to create sort of brand affinity and that'll drive loyalty? Like I'm I'm faithful to Xbox Live. A thousand, oh, you haven't spent much time on YouTube. A thousand percent. Um, gamers are incredibly passionate about the platforms that they play on. Um, and part of that are the studios and the games that are exclusive to each individual console. Um, so, And Microsoft's very powerful with that. So they have one of the, arguably, probably the biggest franchise in history with Halo. Um, another great one of, with Gears of War. Um, they're race they have probably best-in-class racing game at Forza, and these are all exclusive to Microsoft, all Microsoft-owned properties, and they haven't stopped buying great and interesting game companies. Um, earlier this year, they announced they had bought Compulsion Games, or acquired Compulsion Games, which makes a very interesting like horror game called uh, The Happy Few. Um, and that's why we had kind of that slide where we recommended some potential acquisitions that can, can kind of create user lock-in and ensure that the passionate fans are, are entertained and happy. So Telltale Games, which makes fantastic kind of like uh, licensed um, story games, went bankrupt earlier this year. They shouldn't have. So I would imagine there's a cheap acquisition there. Um, THQ Nordic has been buying up a lot of the smaller indie studios. So if you, if you were to buy something like a THQ Nordic, you would all of a sudden have, I think it's close to maybe 50 very interesting IPs that could be revived. And hey, you know what? They're all exclusive to Microsoft now. And Double Fine, yes, Double Fine, which is kind of an, an, an indie darling as well. Thank you. <laughs> you see, see th there's so many that it's, if, you, if we were to put up a slide of all the properties that Microsoft owns, it would, it would be a very busy looking slide. Okay, I know that the group has another company to visit right now, so let's wrap it up. <laughs> and thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you.